Just to say good morning, um, and thank you very much to Steffi for that lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Rooney, and as, as uh, Steffi just pointed out, uh, until very, very recently, last Friday, I was the uh, technology editor of the Wall Street Journal, and I'm absolutely delighted to have joined uh, Infamilo uh, as the uh, co-editor-in-chief, working alongside Jennifer, uh, who's sitting on the front there. We're here to talk about uh, mobile payments, and who better a person to have than, uh, than Marcus White. Marcus, why don't you introduce yourself and introduce uh, Wirecard, uh, and tell us what, you know, what your role is and what Wirecard does. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from my side. Let's, let me first pay my respect to DLD. Of course. Uh, thank you for having me the second time. DLD has now its 10 years anniversary. I think it's a great story, and we need more of such institutions in, in Europe. A short introduction to myself. I'm the CEO of Wirecard since 10 years. Wirecard is the leading online payment processing company. Uh, and we're currently in the process to bring internet technology into mobile, into point of sale. The core business model is B2B, so it's not so charismatic as showing an iPhone. So I do, do not want to spend too much time uh, in going too much detail, perhaps two short sentences. We very much differentiate in covering the full value chain, so we're not only doing the technology in terms of risk, risk management, payment processing, but we also cover all bank processes, namely the acquiring, the issuing. So for example, when we now come to mobile payment, uh, we are not only providing the app, the wallet, et cetera, but we also provide or we issue prepaid and debit cards on a MasterCard and Visa basis, for example, in corporations with big MNOs. So we cover the full value chain and we provide our solutions not only on our own brand, but also on a white label basis. This is why we are not so, no so known, because very often when you buy online over a merchant, you don't see us, we're in the back end, you just give your credit card, your Visa or MasterCard or your debit card, and uh, we are the outsourcing partner of the merchant. So we do everything in the back end uh, and do the processing and all related bank processes. This is where we come from. On this basis, we are today by far the biggest European player, and we have now also a strong grip into, into Asia. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I should just say, at the end of this, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll get some time for questions. Uh, so if you have questions about mobile payment, um, then obviously Marcus is the man uh, for this. I think my first question is, um, everyone talks about this great sort of digital future of that, you know, mobile payments are this sort of unassailable good and, and how we, this is something that all customers and consumers are craving. Well, I mean, are they? What, what problem does using my mobile phone to pay for things actually solve. I have some, I have, you know, some quite good things in my wallet uh, that are quite good at paying for things. So why do I want to use my phone? Let me first say, when we come to mobile payment, I think it's very often a misguided discussion in terms of we discuss over technologies, we discuss over QR code versus NFC versus uh, now Beacon. Plus. We are going to talk about Beacon. We do. We're not going to get. You're not going to get away without talking about Beacon. <laughs> uh, and I think that we have to exactly. We have to discuss about use cases because I think that with mobile payment, it will only work if the payment is totally integrated into value-added services for the consumer. Might it be? that, for example, we discussed it uh, already shortly, in a stadium, when you, when, you, when you come to a stadium, you are directly recognized. You don't have to go to a certain security area because the, the app, the wallet, directly recognizes that you have a valid ticket. So you solve the bottleneck at the entry of a stadium, and then inside of the stadium, so you, you are, for example, directly guided to your place. When you want to buy something, when you buy, want to buy your Coke or your beer, uh, you don't have to go somewhere, but you directly order it over your mobile phone, and in the pause, you get directly delivered the product. That's one example. Or well, let's take a concrete case that we already executed in Singapore with the Singaporean Transport Organization. 
Singapore has a very strong proprietary debit card, the EasyLink card that is mainly used for transport, for going over the underground or going over the bus or in, in uh, taxis. Uh, this, this has to be top up, so cash has to put into this card so that you can use it. We have now an NFC solution in place where you can top up your EasyLink debit card over your mobile phone. So you don't have to go to a point of sale top up station where normally, of course, at the peak times, there's a lot of queuing. So I think this, this is exactly what we have to talk about. Uh, and let me give you a second message. Of course, mobile payment is really early stage. I always compare it to the internet in the beginning of the 2000 years or end of 90s, or the PC market in the beginning of the 80s. It's really early stage. But I say in five years, you will all wake up and you will do 80% of your transactions uh, over your mobile phone. Totally integrated in such use cases. Okay, you didn't want to talk about technology, but I'm going to, I'm going to rain on no, your... We can talk about technology, but I just say... It's, I'm, going to, it's... I'm going to rain on your parade, because I've been covering technology for a long time, and one of the technologies that has always been this, like, you know, next year will be the year of um, NFC. Um, and one of the things you were talking about there was NFC, and th there's a great resistance to it because basically consumers don't see any particular value in it. It's like, what are you adding? Why do I need to do this that, 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 to change my existing behaviors? One of the big problems, as we know, with every technology is about getting consumers to change behavior. And they will only change behavior if there is a value to, to, in doing that. Well, you know, you say in five years' time we're all gonna be doing that. Five years ago, the NFC forum were going, oh, you wait in five years' time, everyone's going to be doing And they're not. So what's going to change? What's different? Again, when we come to NFC, we, we can discuss the technology. But I say NFC will be a technology that brings, out, brings down the checkout time at the, at the point of sale. We have here already good statistical indications that the checkout time at the retail store can be reduced by 25 to 30 percent. And that's for the merchant real money. And when you're buying on a Saturday, uh, uh, on a Saturday during Christmas time, I think also as a consumer, you will highly appreciate every reduction of this checkout time. So I think this is a very simple example for a very strong use case. Additionally, we, we strongly believe that for the merchant, of course, mobile payment could also bring down the total costs of uh, the, the electronic payment processing. So I think there are some very uncharismatic uh, first basic arguments that you bring down checkout time and that you bring down, bring down costs. But, but again, the payment is just a basic infrastructure. I would, I would compare it to a real-time highway that is here set up. The payment is the highway, and now we have to define the cars that follow this highway and that bring the additional value add to the consumer. Let me, let me give an additional example. Today it's about reducing the checkout time, but I think when we later discuss, for example, Bluetooth, yeah, uh, 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 low, uh, uh, low energy, uh, we will come to the point that perhaps also in the future when you walk through a supermarket, you can finalize the buying ongoing. So you don't have to put the pro or of course you still have to put the product in your in in, 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 okay. in your trolley, but you don't have to check out by paying at the final point, but you pay ongoing when you walk through the retail store. Okay, I, I'm, I'm determined to put the nail in the coffin of NFC uh, on this one. Um, and I will uh, just quote from, a, there was a Gartner report that looked into this and uh, they said their prediction for NFC is that Gartner forecasts that NFC will account for only 2% of total transaction value in 2013, and that will only rise to 5% of total transaction by 2017. So Gartner clearly doesn't have a lot of faith uh, in NFC. But let's move on from NFC, because as you say, let's talk about iBeacon or Beacon technology, because this does seem to me to be quite interesting. So is everyone familiar with beacon technology, Bluetooth low energy. Do people understand that? or do, Why don't you give a 30 second precy of what, what Bluetooth low energy is or beacon technology? 
for people who Beacons don't are basically low cost and low power transmitters where you can transmit information on basis from Bluetooth. They basically enable uh, a localization of a consumer in a closed space in an indoor situation. Because in an indoor situation, normally GPS doesn't work properly. It doesn't deliver the service level that you would need for a, a real-time communication process. Also, Wi-Fi is not reliable enough. So basically, it enables an indoor situation, and it gives you a perfect uh, real-time way to address the consumer, for example, in a retail store, in a stadium, in an underground station, uh, everywhere where GPS doesn't work. So do you think, I mean, I, as you can tell, I'm skeptical about NFC, but I wonder whether Beacon is actually, or Beacon Technologies are the compelling use case. So do you see that there's quite a, a major step in these two technologies, from NFC, which requires me to go around tapping on things and all that kind of stuff, and, and if you were an Apple user, you don't even have Bluetooth anyway. Do you think that Beacon actually maybe that is the technology that's going to actually transform the mobile payment system? And if so, why? Let me first say we see beacons very complementary to NFC. NFC probably will be, the, or it will be the perfect solution for a retail store where you have a very high throughput. So take the Walmart situation, the IKEA, the HMNs, etc., And where you need a technology that very seamless integrates in the today's cash situation of such a merchant. He has a terminal, he has a back-end cash system, and he wants something that on a very cost-effective basis integrates into the systems with a service level that he needs. Here, NFC definitely is here to stay. So I see beacons as an additional complementary element. I see beacons more as a substitute for a QR code. Okay. So I would say that beacons have their strength exactly at value-added services, at targeting, targeted marketing, for example, at the stadium situation we discussed before. Yeah. So their beacons are much stronger because exactly they allow to localize you uh, uh, in a perfect and reliable way in an indoor situation. So there I see beacons. I, if we discuss about technology, I see very much a complementary situation between NFC and iBeacons. So how do we, I mean, beacons seem to me to be this, uh, uh, finally is going to be this idea that when I walk past Starbucks, it's going to say, you know, get 5% off, whatever. How do you get around the creepy factor uh, in these kind of technologies? The like, oh, hello, Ben, it's two weeks since you were last here, um, and this idea that I'm being followed around, which a lot of consumers find very disturbing. You know, do you see that as an obstacle to consumer uptake? Uh, let me first say, I think every technology also must be uh, uh, must give the, the flexibility to be turned off. So if you don't want it, turn it off. But of course, already today, if you have a smartphone with you, you can be localized. So beacons just bring this additional value add that you can be localized in an indoor situation. But already, if you, if you have a GPS-based cell phone, yeah. you can be localized today. So uh, beacons doesn't bring an additional risk level uh, in, in my understanding. They just built on today's situation that there are seven billion uh, cell phones out there from which two billion are smartphones, uh, which is significantly more actually than active credit and debit card accounts, which are somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 billion. So I think that's the charisma charismatic thing, building on this platform and building this real-time highway on which value-added cars uh, will be will be going on a very fast basis, and that's let's say uh, that doesn't bring an additional risk level in my understanding to the consumer. But I think that every provider should give the consumer the ability to turn it off. So if you don't want it, turn it off. And normally with an iBeacon app, when you come near a situation where you're localized, you get a message whether you want to introduce yourself or whether you don't want to introduce yourself. And I think that's exactly the way how to address that. This seems to me a slightly dystopian, a rather sort of nightmare scenario. This means every time I go near, every time I go near some Starbucks or something like this, my damn phone is going to go off. Um, and this seems to me a thing that's designed for people who are worried that the battery on their phone lasts too long. I mean, if every time I go past one of these things, it's going to bleep at me, it's never going to stop. So 
I do come back to this question about how do you see user, how do you see winning over the user? How, what is it the steps that people are gonna have to take to convince consumers that this is something they want, not something that merchants want to draw, you know, to push at consumers? Yeah. Again, I think the, 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 the basic value add always will be, will be bringing down checkout times, uh, solving cumulative payment processes where you have a big chain of people. Again, this situation, Saturday, H&M, a lot of people standing before the cash desk. When you solve such situations, I think the consumer will we'll appreciate come, it. Will appreciate it. Will appreciate it. We will see. So, now, I said we go to questions from the audience. I don't know if we have microphones. Um, we do. Gentlemen, right on the front. See the virtue of getting here early. You, you get the first question. Thank you very much. Uh, Felix Salmon from Reuters. I have a question about the, the highway, the, the rails that the payments move on. When I'm making a payment, whether it's to a merchant or to another individual, um, are those payments always going to run through the existing rails between banks which have been around for decades? Or in the future, are we going to see faster and more efficient and cheaper rails based on some kind of cryptocurrencies? Ooh, what a good question. <laughs> uh, le let me first say on a very high level, as I, I'm always reluctant to just uh, have a technical discussion, I'm always also quite reluctant to have this discussion, will the big credit card organizations be successful, will there be an upcoming new network, for example, that directly benefits from bank accounts, like uh, uh, MCX tries it in the US with, with ACH, or will there be new upcoming internet currencies? I think, first of all, we always have to have these use cases, and I say the company will be successful, and also the payment infrastructure that really delivers these use cases and that is available at every merchant. It's that simple. You, you need a really seeming last experience and then you will be successful. And that, whether this will be MNOs, banks, or some uh, new upcoming companies, we will see. I, I personally strongly believe that, of course, you have to uh, build partnership of the fittest. This is why we, in our initiatives, always partner with Visa MasterCard because Visa MasterCard are available at every point of sale store. And, and that's a really strong argument. And that's my strong argument today against proprietary solutions. It has taken the big credit card organizations 30 years to come to this point. Uh, and we see how proprietary wallets, I don't name one, but probably uh, you have one or the other in your mindset, how, they, how tough it is now to try to get into the point of sale because they try to bring a proprietary acceptance point that is additionally to the Visa and MasterCard acceptance point to the point of sale. Uh, to, 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 to also take your uh, uh, point to new uh, online currencies, uh, let me say, I think the idea behind having an online currency that is not dependent on a specific state and a specific, let's say, national bank, that's a smart idea. But not doing it with a new kind of central bank that guarantees certain exchange rates at a certain time is a tough thing. And I think that makes it not sustainable. But uh, the basic idea is a smart idea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all of these clocks in front of me have gone a hideous color of red, uh, which means that we, uh, we run out of time. I'm going to sneak in one very quick last question. Are you going to support Bitcoin going forward? I just gave indirectly the I know, answer. I'm, yeah, I'm going to ask a direct question. Uh, we, we, we have a look at this idea, but as it is set up today, I don't think, or I, I just see it as a speculative element. Okay. We, so. so no, is the, as it's set up today. In short term, no. Excellent. Well, look, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Huge topic. We had to do it in 20 minutes. Uh, Marcus, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the good question.